Welcome to Rumsey Vital Signs. My name is Alex Lutz. On our show, you'll meet the fantastic people who make Richmond University Medical Center thrive. Rumsey is an award-winning full-service hospital located right here on Staten Island at 355 Bard Avenue. To learn more about the full array of services provided at Rumsey, visit www.rumseysi.org. In this episode, we're going to be talking about angioplasty, a minimally invasive procedure that restores blood flow through narrow or blocked arteries. Over 850,000 angioplasty procedures are performed annually in the United States, including at Richmond University Medical Center. With me today is Dr. Francesco Rotatori, a board-certified cardiologist and chief of Rumsey's cardiovascular department. Dr. Rotatori graduated from medical school at the University of Milan in Italy and did postgraduate training at the Centro Cardiologico Manzino, also in Milan, where it specializes in cardiovascular disease. He later attended SUNY Downstate College of Medicine in Brooklyn and joined Rumsey in 2017. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Alex. So let's start off, Dr. Rotatori, if you want to just kind of, we have a model of the heart if we want to bring it up. Um, you want to bring the, sure. the model up, we can talk. Just give us a brief anatomy, if you will, of, of, of the heart. Okay, so this is uh, something that I know a little bit about. <laughs> uh, um, um, so what we see here, I mean, this is uh, it's the heart. Now, our heart is, of course, we all know, is uh, inside our chest, a little bit on the left side, is um, um, much smaller than this. It's uh, smaller than this. Um, uh, it's about the size of your fist, a little bigger. And um, of course, uh, the heart has uh, four chambers. And uh, four chambers, meaning um, is divided in four parts. And from the heart, there are vessels coming out. And uh, this big vessel, like the red one that you see here, mm -hmm. this is the aorta. The aorta comes out, of the comes out of the heart, right from the left ventricle, turns around and goes down towards the, towards the stomach area. Uh, this vessel provides blood supply to the entire body, from here to the neck and to the arms, and then all the way down to the legs. Of course, the blood, once it gets into the periphery, has to come back and comes back to the right side. comes back to the right side through these big veins, one from the inferior vena cava down here and superior vena cava on this side, and they merge to the right atrium, from the right atrium to the right ventricle, and then back to the lungs where the blood uh, receives uh, oxygenation, receives the oxygen, and then it goes back into the left atrium and back into the left ventricle. Interesting enough, the heart is a pump, and to work has also some valves that I can show you here. Maybe you can see a little bit. There are valves inside the heart that they open and close during the cardiac cycle. We have another one on this side. And um, those valves, they allow the blood to go into the right direction, of course. It's very simple at the end of the day. It's a very simple pump, but it's the pump that provides blood supply to all the organs in the, in, in the body, so it has to work. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you determine that someone needs an angioplasty? All right, so um, the angioplasty is a procedure that we do to reopen clogged arteries. Of course, um, being the heart and muscles, also the heart itself needs blood supply. So in this, uh, in this uh, uh, graph here, what we design is that there are these red lines and blue lines here are the vessels that are actually surrounding the heart. Those vessels that they receive blood supply from the aorta, like any other artery in the heart, those vessels, they need to bring blood supply to the heart muscle to work. Every muscle in our body needs blood supply. Muscle in the legs, muscle in the arms, also the heart muscle. So unfortunately, sometimes what can happen is that because of uh, a lot of factors that I can explain in a little, in a little bit, uh, this heart can get, these arteries can get clogged. So the inside lumen, the inside lumen where the blood is flowing through, is going to reduce its caliber to the point that very little flow is going to pass through that artery. Of course, at that point, one portion of the heart muscle is going to suffer. And this can happen in acute settings. There can be an immediate closure of the artery due to a formation of a clot in the artery, or can be a slow process in which the artery narrows down in time, and then it doesn't close completely, but narrows the artery to the point that not enough blood flow is getting to the heart, and so that's where the angioplasty com comes into place. Yeah, that's about it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so now once you make the determination that a patient needs angioplasty, how do you, how do you perform an actual angioplasty? Okay, so the angioplasty is a procedure in which basically 
uh, we get access to, this, to the bloodstream. We have to get to the aorta. We have to get to where the blood supply comes to the heart. So how do we get to the aorta is to one of its branches. Uh, nowadays, 90% of the time, we come from an artery, the radial artery here on your wrist. So we introduce a little catheter in the wrist, and then from the inside of that catheter, we advance a longer catheter that, which, that travels up to the arm, and they get to the subclavian artery, down to, the, to this common artery, and back down into the aorta. Right where the aorta comes out, to, comes out from the ventricle, there are the opening of the coronary arteries, these arteries that are providing blood supply to the heart. These catheters outside are connected to a syringe that has contrast. We inject contrast. The patient is going to be on an operating table with an x-ray machine moving. We take pictures with the x-ray and we inject contrast at the same time. So we see how the contrast fills the vessel. If the contrast at one point becomes narrow, there's an interruption, and we'll see picture later, we'll see video later, that there's an interruption, uh, interruption, then we know that there's the blockage. During the same procedure, through the inside of that catheter, we can thread a little wire. It's very, very tiny, it's 0.014 millimeter diameter, so hmm. it looks like a hair. It's a little wire that passes through the lesion, and then we use that wire as a rail to bring balloons or stents. What are balloons? Balloons are these little balloons that are that are compressed around, the, their, um, around the, the wire. They are positioned where the blockage is and then expanded right where the blockage is from the inside of the artery. That expansion, they, of course, opens up the blockage. Then, of course, the balloon is deflated and is taken out. It would, be, it, would be, it would be great if you could do only balloon, but the problem is that once we deflate the balloon and we pull it out, our studies have shown that in a little bit of time, the vessel will tend to narrow down again and close. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we put a stent. And a stent is a metallic cylinder. It's a metallic mesh, a cylinder, that again, it's compressed over a balloon, positioned when the occlusion is. It's inflated. The balloon is inflated. The stent comes out. And then the balloon is deflated and comes out. The stent remains in place and keeps the vessel open for good. Mm. And this sounds like a very graphic procedure. I'm assuming this is done under anesthesia? So the patient is awake throughout the procedure. Mm -hmm. We call it conscious, conscious sedation, which means that we give medication to, um, to relax because, of course, you have, to, you have to stand still for a little bit of time. We give pain medication. It's a pain-free uh, procedure. It's really, there's no much pain. But we make medication to, uh, to relax, and, uh, but the patient is awake throughout the procedure. In fact... Sometimes we talk to the patient, we ask, of course, how they're doing and everything, and also sometimes they have to help us with taking a deep breath and all this. So there is a little bit of cooperation. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, the procedure is, uh, the patient is awake. And is this a procedure that someone does as, is it always scheduled? Can you actually do it if someone is suffering a heart attack in the moment? Yes, of course, those are the most difficult procedures that we do in emergency settings. Uh, sometimes, as I said, these arteries can close suddenly. And that causes that uh, heart attack that uh, is presented, as everybody knows, most of the time. Um, you start to complain of sudden chest pain, very intense chest pain. Of course, an ambulance is called right away. And there is a system in, in, uh, in uh, Staten Island, of course, where the ambulance comes to the field, does an EKG. And if the EKG is concerning for a heart attack, we get activated immediately. And by the time the ambulance comes to the hospital, well, most of the time we're already there waiting for the patient and being able to do this procedure uh, in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I'm not to mention, but just recently we received um, a gold award because we were able, from the American Heart Association, because, because of the timeliness and, and the effectiveness in th this procedure that we've been performing at Ramsey mm -hmm. for the past year. And um, it, it's, it requires a lot of work, it requires a lot of cooperation starting from the EMS, activating the, 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 the STEMI, as we call it, the ST elevation, and uh, from the point when the patient comes very quickly to the emergency room, gets all that is needed in the emergency room in a few minutes, and then shipped to the cat lab for the procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, the standard of care is that we need to reopen the artery within 90 minutes from the activation, so we call it first medical contact to balloon time, 
within 90 minutes. And that's what we do in the vast majority of our cases. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing the balloons and the stents, are there other things you can do to help open arteries or, or clog arteries in there? Yes, of course. Uh, um, there's a, there's an old variety of uh, of, um, of intervention that that uh, that we do, and uh, these have been developed in years. And uh, one of the the problem, for instance, that we encounter is that, especially in uh, uh, blockages that they have developed in years and years and years. There is a component of calcium, calcification, hardening of this vest, of this uh, blockages that uh, doesn't allow the blockages to be opened simply by uh, inflating a balloon. So sometimes you have to do um, literally a shaving of this calcium inside the artery. And, uh, or, um, and that's called, uh, there's a device called rotablator that allows basically shaving of the calcium inside the vessel. Also, uh, sometimes we do there is a new, um, a new device, a fairly new device that is called intravascular lithotripsy, which means that basically what we do is we deliver shock waves, same that we, they do for kidney stones. Mm -hmm. From the inside the vessel, we deliver shock waves that they break down this, this uh, pile of calcium around the vessel to allow a better deployment of the stent. And how long does an actual angioplasty, not in a heart attack situation, how long does the procedure actually take? So I usually tell my patients that uh, first I need to know what the problem is. And the diagnostic procedure is about 20, 25 minutes mm -hmm. from when we start to when we finish. Mm -hmm. uh, if the angioplasty is needed, uh, I usually tell them to add about an hour. Mm -hmm. It is also true that it's very variable. I mean, it can be a very simple, straightforward procedure in 30 minutes. Um, and sometimes instead, when all these devices have to be used in, uh, sequentially, it can last for like over an hour, an hour and a half. Does this procedure require someone to be admitted overnight or is it usually an in and out process on the same day? Well, we've learned a lot of things. We learn how to manage the complications and so on. And so lately, most, the vast majority of our patients that they're coming from elective procedure, they go home same day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need to, you know, because of, I mean, because of um, problem at the same time, like kidney disease or so, mm -hmm. we keep them overnight for some IV fluids, monitoring, but most of the time they can go home the same day. Are there any risk factors to having an angioplasty performed? Well, so mm, when, you, when you have an angioplasty performed, it means that you have a clogged artery. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, um, a clogged artery has multiple reasons why this can happen. There is a genetic component. Uh, it runs in the family, as we say, but I mean, it's definitely some, there is a genetic component. Some people are more predisposed than others to deposit cholesterol in their arteries, to build up cholesterol in their arteries. Of course, a high level of cholesterol, circulating cholesterol, are correlated with the position of cholesterol, but also high blood pressure, smoke, um, diabetes, uh, sedentary lifestyle. Those are all common risk factors that they increase the chances um, to have a clogged artery and then ended up needing an angioplasty. And how often do you perform stenting in, a, in an angioplasty in a given year? Have you put a lot of stents? Yeah, of course. I mean, um, our hospital is um, it's uh, a, a little less than 200 um, inter in stents a year, mm -hmm. um, from which a third of them are in emergency settings. Um, um, Angioplasty alone is never performed nowadays. It's basically, I mean, very, very rarely performed. Most of the time, they all require stenting. Mm -hmm. Can you put multiple stents into a, a blocked artery? You can. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, there is a, a, um, um, there is a li little extra step to discuss when we talk mm -hmm. about stenting, of course. And again, the way I usually explain to my patient is, Imagine that you have a highway and uh, the highway has a breakdown in a certain spot, in a certain spot. The stent will fix that, that it's like a road work on that specific segment. The stent will not prevent that before or after then the road is going to eventually break down. So um, uh, sometimes you go in for a stent, you fix one, uh, one segment and then a couple of years later probably because the risk factors are not corrected appropriately or because the genetics is really not favorable, you end up having a new road work that needs to be fixed so you get another stent. Mm -hmm. 
It is also true that uh, um, there is another procedure that is an old one. I mean, years ago was the only choice that was available. There was a bypass surgery. Mm -hmm. Bypass surgery, of course, is, uh, is instead it's a major heart surgery in which, of course, you have to open the chest. And that provides uh, a new conduit, a new blood supply to the heart. So once you have really so many, too many different areas that requires intervention, then we refer for bypass surgery. I see. Um, of course, we, there are multiple criteria that we use. So the, the short answer is that can we do multiple stent? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the longer answer is that multiple stent and bypass surgery, they always have to be weighted once we find multiple blockages. Mm -hmm. And is stenting successful if stenting is the, the, the determination to be made? Um, I mean, in the sense, of how long is it, if you have a stent, is, how long does it stay functional in most cases? Okay, yeah, so um, stent, of course, when we say put a stent, a stent is for good. Mm -hmm. And um, in the vast majority of patients, a stent will last forever. The stent is, up, up, is, uh, is expanded into the vessel wall, and then within a few months, it's get covered by the inner layer of the artery. It's called endothelium. Mm -hmm. It's a one layer of cells. And so basically becomes part of the wall of the artery, mm -hmm. the stent. And after that, there's really very little chance that the stent is going to cause problem in the future. In the first few months when the stent is applied, there's a, there, is a, there is a couple of concerns. One is that the injury, the insult, the inflammation that this ex expansion of the stent that created to the wall can cause regrowth of tissue inside the stent and narrow it down. Um, in the past now, it's over 10 years, I mean, we've, um, we've been using drug eluting stents, well, 20 years. We've been using, time flies, <laughs> we've been using drug eluting stents. So basically, our stents that we apply, they are coated with a medication that minimize the risk that there is, there is regrowth of tissue inside. So um, we, we definitely have, uh, we have uh, um, a very good success with stenting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so if the question is, is the stent works? I mean, the vast majority of time, stent is, is a solution of the problem mm -hmm. for good. Again, the only problem is that if the disease develops in other areas, then you're going to need other stents. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a lot of uh, things that angioplasty can help with. And obviously, as you pointed out, it can, it can pinpoint or lead to the need for larger, more, uh, I'll say, invasive procedures to be done. So we're going to take a short break, and when we return, we're going to scrub in with Dr. Rotatori, and he's going to go over some actual angioplasty procedures that he's performed at Rumsey, and give us a glimpse of what it's like to perform this potentially life-saving procedure. I don't know why you're so sad. You've got a roof over your head. you got to stop with that depressing stuff. That's a white people thing. You all right? It just feels like it's coming from everywhere. Do you want to talk about it? You can talk to me if you're feeling sad. Whenever you need to talk, I'm here, okay? We're back and continuing our conversation with Dr. Francesco Rotatori from Rumsey's Cardiovascular Department. So we've talked about a number of procedures that Dr. Rotatori performs. Now we're actually going to see them visually as he's been kind enough to share some, uh, some video with us about the different procedures that he performs. So why don't you tell us what we're going to see, Dr. Rotatori? Yes, of course. So now we're going to see something uh, more interesting than just words. <laughs> so um, um, as I was explaining before, I'm going to show you, first of all, how we perform the diagnostic part in which we look where the blockages are or so. And what we see here in the screen, this is our catheter, the one that comes from, uh, from the wrist most of the time. And right now, the, our catheter is sitting inside, um, inside the, mm, the left ventricle. And as you're going to see, we're going to inject. This is the contrast injecting. And the ventricle, of course, squeezes the contrast out. This is called ventriculogram. As, uh, it helps us to see if the squeezing, the pumping function of the heart is good. And then instead, we pull the catheter a little back, and now we're going to start seeing the coronary arteries, the arteries that provide blood supply to the heart. 
So as you see here, we're injecting contrast from the tip of this catheter and the contrast is filling the artery throughout. Now, of course, we can imagine that if there's no blockage, this contrast will go all the way down and there's going to be no narrowing or, or anything like that. Instead, if we look carefully in this picture, for instance, already we see that this area, specifically this area, is moving. Mm -hmm. Of course, the artery is moving. But in this area, the, um, there is a blockage. Then the contrast gets narrow and there is a blockage right there. We, of course, we have to take different pictures. So when the patient is on the table, we'll hear the sound of the x-ray machine moving and taking different views because these are three-dimensional uh, structure. And of course, the video is two-dimensional. Two so this is the same artery seen from another perspective. And it allows us to see that there might be a little more disease right down here. And then we go to another view and of, of the same artery. And actually, this view allows us to see to pinpoint oh, the right worst there. of the yeah. blockages right around this area, right mm -hmm. around this area here. Okay? So, yeah. so this is the right coronary artery. It goes all the way around the um, AV groove, meaning the space between the atrium and the ventricle on the right side, and then give rise to this terminal branch that is called posterior descending artery. So um, this is the, the right system, which is, uh, we just seen the right coronary artery, which is a little easier to, 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 to follow. And this is the picture that we call a spider view because it looks like a little bit like a spider. What, uh, what you have to understand is that we call it coronary artery tree. What does it mean? It means that, of course, it's like a tree. There are bigger branches. So we always say to the patient, oh, the coronary, the, the coronary on the left side, the arteries are two. In reality, we see a bunch of arteries, a bunch of, of, uh, of, um, of vessels, but and the, those are branches of the two major ones. The major one is one here and the one right behind it. Of course, a different view to see it. So this is the circumflex artery that gives branches. We call the obtuse marginal branches. And these branches allow us to see um, the artery in, uh, in its, uh, its in, uh, entirety. And so we see that this vessel, unfortunately, is diffusely diseased and has blockages that, uh, that are especially on this area. See how this becomes narrow compared to how big is over here. This becomes much narrower. And, uh, and again, we'll see even down this, around, around down this area, there's another blockage. Um, of course, this uh, um, is the same artery with another view. And we're going to see it. And you see again this artery again. With the, see how the caliber is very big here, and then it becomes much m smaller. Mm -hmm. And that is because there is a blockage right there. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, this vessel here, this big vessel here, we don't see it very well right now. There's a little bit of overlapping. So then we take another different view of the same artery. And this is where the LAD, this is our, what we call it, one of the most important artery in the heart. But I mean, of course, they're all important. But <laughs> <laughs> this one has comes down this way, goes all the way to the tip of the of the of the heart, and actually wraps around the tip of the heart and goes a little back up. And there is disease definitely in this area, and it's much more clear probably in the next picture, and where we see see right here. So you can definitely pinpoint. Let's see if I can stop it. See right here. The vessel here is severely diseased. So again, it's our catheter injecting contrast, filling up the vessel, and finding the blockage. Mm -hmm. So um, of course, this is the part in which, uh, and I have, I have um, the last picture of this. Um, this is uh, the part in which we do the diagnostic. We see what the blockage is, and we decided if the blockage needs to be treated or not. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I want to show you also what we do when we actually um, um, take care of the blockage. And uh, I go to this one here that might be uh, even more easier to understand. See how this is a big blockage. This is the mm. right coronary artery of another one of our patients. And you see how when the artery fills up, the contrast is actually missing in here, almost mm -hmm. completely missing. And that's because there is a type blockage there. So what we do, as I said, we uh, do angioplasty. And what is it? Basically, we threaten a wire. This is the tiny wire that is inside. Mm -hmm. And these are the two markers of the balloon that we are going to inflate. And you're going to see it here. So this is our 
um, our markers and this is our balloon inflated. See, mm -hmm. we put contrast inside the balloon so then we see it when it's inflated. This is the inflated balloon. And uh, see, inflated and trying to reopen the artery. And you see that just by doing the balloon, the artery has improved. Has improved wow. but still is not perfect, but mm -hmm. has improved. Mm -hmm. But there is still some area there. So what we do is we put a stent. Mm -hmm. This is the stent, again. Uh, it's uh, dark um, because now it's all <laughs> squeezed over, over a balloon. And then we inflate it, and when we inflate it, then it's going um, it's gonna to stretch open, and it's going to open the artery. And you're going to see the final result, which is this wow. one. What a difference. See how now yeah. it looks perfectly open and nice. Mm -hmm. You see? So this is, the, uh, this is what we do. And then we take out our wire, and this is the last picture that we usually show our patient, and we're all happy to show how mm -hmm. now the artery is all open and working properly. Mm -hmm. This patient came and was having a lot of chest pain after this procedure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely chest pain free. So you talked about stenting, you talked about the inserting the balloon. You mentioned other procedures that you're able to do. What are some of those other procedures you can do? So I just wanted to mention a couple of things that we do in our hospital and that, uh, of course, sometimes these patients are very, very sick and so they need a procedure. They need, they need a device to help them, um, to help them um, support their heart because the heart is not, be, be, it's not beating appropriately because one area is not moving. This device is called Impella and what it does really while we're trying to reopen the artery, it's uh, basically sucking blood from the ventricle and pushing it out into, to, through this uh, rotor system and pushing it out into the aorta. So basically being a second heart, basically doing the work of the heart while the heart is trying to heal. The other things that I mentioned that we do pretty much in all our cases, inside the artery, you see in this picture what happened is that we are inside the artery. What we see around here is the wall of the artery. So what we can do is we can go inside the artery and bring an ultrasound probe and take pictures of the heart from the inside. And I was talking about the drilling before, the rotablator. See, when the artery has too much calcium in it, and this is our wire as we showed it before. Those, of course, are not real images, but this is a, um, um, it's a little movie of it. This is a diamond-shaped, uh, much, much smaller than this, 2 millimeters, 1.5 wow. millimeters, drills down and create the channels. And uh, the other thing that I mentioned before was the lithotripsy. This is a balloon that has shock waves. So by creating the shock waves, this calcium here is gonna start breaking down. And the breaking down of the calcium will eventually allow the balloon to expand much easier. And so then a stent is placed. So basically these are a few of the things that we do in our hospital. Great. I want to thank Dr. Rotatori for his time, and I'd like to just share a personal note with, uh, with you as the audience. The um, angiogram and angioplasty procedure you saw early was actually my own. I had triple bypass surgery a year ago uh, with our partners at Mount Sinai Hospital, but Dr. Rotatori and his team are the ones who found my blockages. Um, I had triple bypass. I've recovered. So I just want to put a word out there that if you do have issues or think you may have issues with your heart, please see Dr. Rotatori. There'll be an ad at the end of this show that has his contact information. Come in and get checked. I'm living a happy life, um, playing golf, lifting weights, running five miles. So it is a, a second chance at life. And I want to thank Dr. Rotatori publicly, as I have always have, for everything that you've done for me and my family. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for watching today's episode. As I said, there'll be a... Um, There'll be an uh, ad at the end of this episode with Dr. Auditori's information. Thanks for watching Vital Signs.